course it's serious. This is capital letters B I G, as in Galileo. Time to rethink geocentrism. And it's very easy to paint in this style. Still water is always level. Still water is always level. Always level. Always level. 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 Greetings. This is Masterpiece. And though it's spelled this way, it also refers to my artistic self. Just so I'm not wasting any time, if you would like to skip this introduction, just skip ahead to about the 7 minute 30 mark and you'll get what you came for. As long as I can remember, I have had an above average ability to imagine details of objects, faces, or events in great detail. I have also had the ability to render what is inside my mind onto paper or canvas for the public to see. When I was six, my art was published in my regional school board's pamphlet under the headings of the arts. I was always better than or on par with my school art teachers and realized I needed advanced lessons if I was going to truly learn anything. I have won speed painting competitions and have had paintings hung in a few town halls around my way. But I don't say this to toot my own horn, but to legitimize and bring another aspect to this flat earth movement. And that's what I'm calling the APFE, the Artist Perspective on Flat Earth. As an advanced art student, we are shared information that is not given to the standard intellectual or predominantly left-brained population. We are taught to see, and not only that, but how to reproduce what we see so that when it's gone, we can reproduce it and capture its likeness without it physically being there. For example, we as art students need to observe a piece of folded cloth or a nude figure in order to accurately reproduce it in the future when there is no such item present. Say a woman from another country wants a painting of herself from a photograph, but with updated clothes. Instead of a cotton t-shirt, she wants a fleece sweater. As an artist, I would have to reproduce what that particular fabric, texture, light absorption, resting weight, thickness, etc., etc., in order for it to appear realistic, or that she was actually wearing the fleece sweater in the picture. Without learning to observe, an artist like myself would always have to have said object present at the time of production. Any great artist can reproduce anything they've seen or drawn at least once before. This is the power of the artistic mind, which sounds like autistic, and we already know that there are plenty examples of autistic people that are able to reproduce mind-boggling beautiful works of art. But to stay on topic, as a young child learning about the solar system, I, like many children, had many questions. However, I cannot help but feel like my questions were just a little different than the other children, and possibly more advanced. It took a lot of brainwashing and indoctrination via school, Hollywood, TV, and media, etc., to get me to forget these questions that I had when I was young. But since stepping into the flat earth knowledge, these questions and images have come flooding back to my mind, and I'm very excited to share it with you, because what I'm going to share with you today will totally debunk the spherical moon theory from here and forevermore. Before I begin, I want to let you know that the arts are one of the most important realms of learning in existence. Science, maths, and physics can be taught through the arts. When we are learning about intellectual sciences and things like arithmetic, physics, chemistry, etc., etc., we are stimulating the left brain. But when we incorporate the right brain, things like arts and music, well, now we are engaging both hemispheres of the brain, and that empowers our subconscious to connect dots in such ways that present an opportunity to problem-solve for a bigger picture. People who engage their left and right brain while learning also incorporate both while problem-solving. This is why you may experience artsy people as an asset while participating in escape rooms or other creative games. Artsy people are able to think outside the box. In fact, the visual arts are so important and impactful to society that the great artists of the day were actually given the subject matter to paint. 
The elite controlled the subject matter for the artists the very same way they control a performing or a recording artist today. They give them the general outlines and then give the artist their leeway to put their spin on it or to make it theirs, so to speak. Michelangelo detested the process he endured by his most famous work, the Sistine Chapel. He was actually ordered by the church to produce the masterpiece on the ceiling. He was given the subject matter, but it was Michelangelo that physically rendered and mixed the paints and painted it, and it is still influencing and inspiring people today. The imaginative power of an artist is unrivaled by any other character type. From my personal experience, it is sometimes a burden having such photographic true-to-life memory. Haunting and horrible images that are not intended to be viewed stay with an artist long after observed. Scary, twisted, horrifying images are made realistic in nightmares or in waking life, as when someone is describing a surgery or an accident. The graphic reconstruction in the artist's mind is so real, he or she almost feels the pain right then and there. I'm sure most artists watching this can agree. This is why artists are dangerous to the system and why the arts are given as optional school courses or are not taken as seriously as other career choices. If two people told you their professions, one a math teacher, the other an arts teacher, you would probably judge the math teacher to be smarter, more wise, or more trustworthy, dependable, or more professional, or even more deserving of your respect and patience. Which is weird, because everyone can learn math and how to count numbers if they tried, or use a calculator. Yet no matter how hard someone who is not born with an artistic inclination may never be able to develop the talents it takes to render a family portrait, or a landscape, or the correct color, or the moon. And speaking of the moon, allow me to now share the information that will close the case forever on the possibility or the falsity of the moon being a sphere. The moon is 100% absolutely not spherical, and any lunar eclipse proves it, and you can prove it too. All you need is a light source and two spheres. On the right, I'll be showing video footage of past lunar eclipses that we are all familiar with, and on the left, I will be showing what a shadow moving over a sphere actually looks like. A lunar eclipse is not, I repeat, is not a shadow of a sphere or anything else circular moving across a spherical object. How do I know? There are four critical points of observation everyone should be looking at. And I like to call these the confirmation to surface factor, the shadow diffusion factor, the sine wave or S factor, and the reflected light factor. Firstly, I would like to point out the consistency of how a shadow naturally moves along varied surface types. This is the conformation factor. A shadow will conform to any shape that the surface takes, thus, in a way, revealing the true shape of an object. If a shadow moves along something rigid like stairs, it will take the stairs shape revealing the level differential from step to step. If a shadow moves along a concave object like a bowl, the shadow will stretch and skew revealing the concavity of the bowl. If a shadow was to move over the surface of a sphere, it would stretch and skew in a spherical manner, wrapping and receding as it bevels and distorts along the sphere's surface. Note that this does not and has never happened on the surface of the moon during an eclipse. Which brings us to our next factor, the shadow diffusion factor. Note, the shadow is more crisp on the edge of the bowl than it is in the lowest portion of the bowl, and sharpens as it rises back up to the edge or the source of the shadow. Note also that on a sphere, the shadow is most diffused or scattered around the edges as the sphere's surface recedes, and it is the most sharp or defined on the closest portion of the sphere. This is because the closer the source of the shadow is to the surface, the more defined its edges. The further the source of the shadow is from the surface, the larger and more faded or diffused it becomes. 
Another way to say this is if you place an object on a surface with a light source above, the object's shadow will appear most sharp when the object is at rest. But lift the object closer to its light source and you will see the shadow lose its crisp edges and dull or fade away, sometimes to the point where little to no shadow remains. This is the shadow diffusion factor, and in conjunction with the first factor, the conformation to the surface factor, the shadow not only rises and falls, stretches and skews with the surface, but also sharpens and dulls. These two factors are almost all we need to find the true topography or shape of the moon. Yet one factor is missing. This is called the sine wave factor or S factor. Because the moon is said to be a sphere, the shadow that is projected onto the moon should also take on the characteristics of the sphere. This critical factor does not appear on the moon's eclipses whatsoever. The sine wave factor or the S factor is what happens as an object, round or straight, spherical or bent, passes over a sphere's surface. As the shadow moves onto a sphere, it is wrapping around its curve. Starting from the outer edge and moving towards the middle, the shadow takes on the spherical contour and bends upward at its height, then falls backwards in a barrel distorted manner. The shadow will always follow the closest edge due to perspective. The shadow will continue to create the S shape until it reaches the halfway point. As the shadow moves beyond the halfway point, it begins to bevel outward again in a barrel distortion manner. When a shadow moves along a 3D sphere, the center or closest part of the sphere to the observer is the most flat and the shadow's shape and size the most true to life. The sphere will never be flat, but the bigger the sphere is, the less acute the angle of its curvature. So, because the innermost portion of the sphere is the closest to the observer, the less curvature is observed. However, when we observe any lunar eclipse, there is no wrapping, stretching, skewing, sharpening or dulling of the shadow. In fact, every single lunar eclipse looks as if there is one flat disk moving across another flat disk. As the circular shadow moves along the moon, it maintains its circular shape the whole way at the same pace. No stretching, no skewing, no sharpening or dulling. Hopefully you all understood that as it was quite hard for me to put into words. Those three factors are good enough for us to see that the moon is not a sphere, but one factor is needed to realize the moon's surroundings, and that's reflected light. When another object under the same light source is in close proximity of the object in question, i.e. the moon, it should have light bouncing off of the earth and reflecting onto the moon. When another object under the same light source is in close proximity of the object in question, it should have light bouncing off and reflecting onto it. What I mean is this. The closer another object comes to the sphere, the brighter the light it's reflecting will appear. In the made-up heliocentric lie, they tell us that the moon is reflecting the light to the earth. But what about the bigger object, the earth? Does it reflect and bounce light to the moon? It should, but it doesn't. Because if it did, we would then have no new moon phase, and instead more of a dull moon phase, or a dim moon phase. Meaning, as the moon wanes to darkness, it should then be illuminated by the earth. We should still be able to see the same face of the moon that we see every day, because the moon is always facing us. However, it should be dimmer and not luminous because the earth should reflect its massive light towards the dark moon, especially when the moon is further and closer to the earth on its supposed elliptical path, it should brighten and dim in its new moon phase. I repeat, speaking exclusively from new moon to new moon, the moon itself 
should still be visible on that new moon phase, transitioning from dim to slightly brighter back to dim as the moon moves in its elliptical orbit. The object also should reflect the color of its surface and the color of its light source. A gold chain will reflect gold, a green ball will bounce green light, and its reflection on the object will be green. The sun's light is yellow or warm, while the moon's light is blue and cool. Astronauts say the moon is black and white, whatever that means. But if that means it's a scale of grays running from white to black, then it is impossible for the moon to change the sun's light from a warm color and temperature to a cool color and temperature. Yes, the moon's light is colder than the moon's shade. I can understand the moon cooling down the sun's rays and making it less hot, but in no way is it possible for it to actually make the sun's rays colder than the shade at night. Meaning, if you stepped into the moonlight at night, the temperature of the sun's rays reflecting off the surface of the moon and onto your face or thermometer should be greatly reduced, but not colder than if there was no moon at all. When the moon comes out at night, the temperature drops because of the moon's light. This has been confirmed by many experiments using digital thermometers. But staying on course, there is no sign of a reflected light being thrown onto the moon by Earth. What does this mean? This means that the new moon has actually disappeared. While the moon is waxing and waning, we can see the rest of the moon that is not illuminated. However, when there is a new moon, or no sunlight being reflected, we do not see a dim spherical object traversing our sky. In fact, in the daytime, we should still see a dim object traversing the sky, but we have never seen either of these things in our realities. Can you ever remember seeing a dim, non-luminous moon high in the sky at the new moon phase? I repeat, at the new moon phase, not while it's waxing or waning, and not when it's near full. Have you ever seen a dim, non-luminous moon high in the sky at the new moon phase? Now that this information is being brought to light, you will never be able to help but notice something you've never noticed before. That on an eclipse, the shadow has never stretched along the surface of a spherical moon. No stretching, no skewing, no sharpening in or fading away. Not obscured and distorted in sine wave-like motions. No light reflecting onto the moon from Earth. Nothing. Not a single shred of evidence remains that the moon is a spherical body orbiting around or above our Earth. This 100% discounts and debunks any further argument or perspectives that hold to our moon being a sphere in the sky or reflecting the sun's light. This information is in line with the laws of the reflector. The reflector can only reflect light brilliantly if the surface of the reflector is concave, but the outside of the sphere is convex, and convex surfaces only reflect a portion of the light back to the viewer's eye. But a concave surface reaccumulates the spreading light, or reconcentrates the light back to the observer's eye, whereas the convex surface, like the surface of a ball, further scatters the light. If the moon were over 250,000 miles away, then we would only see a portion of the moon, which we would call the hot spot, or the bright spot, or the highlight of the sphere. But there are no hot spots or highlights or bright points on the sphere of the moon indicating the sun's direction. Instead, we have a perfectly evenly lit luminescent moon that gives us cold blue light. In fact, when we look at a full moon, it appears to be flat because the edges of the moon are just as bright as the center or any other part on a full moon. Now that your eyes are opened to the physics and the facts, what will you do?
will you choose to continue believing this lie or observe it for yourself? Anybody can do it. Just go outside and look up. And in case you're wondering about what Neil deGrasse Tyson has to say on the matter, just look how he debunked himself. He went on social media, yes, supposedly the world's leading astrophysicist, anyway, went on social media and posted this ridiculous photo of what he thinks the shadow of a flat earth would look like on the moon. Now, of course, he believes that the moon is a sphere, or at least that's what he says. But if that's the case, then why is there no stretching or skewing of this shadow? Once again, it goes to show you how important it is to be observant and to rely on your own senses. It also displays the innate sense for acute observation to a true artist. We have to combine both worlds, science and spirituality, the abstract and the literal, the arts and the politics, the left and the right brain. We must paint a whole picture in order to see truth in anything. Keep your eyes wide open. And once again, this is Masterpiece. Peace, power, and protection. Respect. This covered letters be I G S M Galileo. Time to rethink geocentrism. Time to rethink geocentrism. Time to rethink geocentrism. Time to rethink geocentrism.